Hello everyone, welcome back again to this online uh, Structural Geology and PTEL course. We are in our lecture number uh, 32 and week 11. Uh, in this week we are learning uh, ductile shear zones. In the previous lecture we learned the different aspects of uh, ductile shear zones and this lecture will particularly focus on the kinematic indicators of ductile shear zones. In the previous lecture, we mostly uh, dealt with the mechanics, how do the shear zones form, their different characteristics and so on. And we concluded the lecture with the fact that the shear zones do produce significant foliations and lineations. And at the same time, because it is a monoclinic symmetry, that means it has a rotational feature within it. The strain is rotational strain, this is why it is a shear strain. And therefore, objects within the shear zones, they have some special characteristics, they have some special features that they produce during shearing and when you see them frozen in the rock within mylonite, we see some characteristic features of these objects and by which we can identify the sense or direction of shears. And these are known as a kinematic or shear sense indicators or shear direction indicators. And this is the topic of this lecture. To review the fact that where to look at, I would like to highlight the fact again that we have to look at the XZ section of the strain ellipsoid. And if you cannot figure out what is X, what is Y, what is Z of the strain ellipsoid of this uh, shear zone that you are particularly looking at, then it is much easier you figure out what is the foliation plane and where is the lineation directed. Now, once you figure out the orientation of the foliation plane and the lineation, then you have to look at approximately along a plane where it is perpendicular to the foliation plane and parallel to the lineation. So, either way they are very same and unless you look for shear sense indicators along this plane, XZ section or a plane which is perpendicular to the foliation and parallel to the lineation which is in this case, this plane in particular, then your interpretation of shear sense would be essentially wrong. So, make sure first that you are looking at on XZ plane or a plane which is perpendicular to the foliation and parallel to the lineation. Once you ensure that, then there are series of kinematic indicators within ductile shear zones which would help you to understand what is the direction of shear. And knowing direction of shear is very, very important in the sense that this gives you the essential kinematic features of that particular shear zone and at the same time local and regional deformation and tectonics in general. Let us start the first one that what is shear sense indicator. In literature, we generally refer the shear senses either by arrows like this or by arrows like this. These are half arrows and they indicate that this is the shear plane or a trace of the plane which is perpendicular to the foliation and parallel to the lineation. So, lineation is in this direction. Now, this means this arrow which is heading in this direction means if you stand in this side here, then materials are moving towards the right side of you. Similarly, if you stand here, it means that materials are moving towards the left side from you. And vice versa, if you stand here, then you would again see facing this shear zone, you will see that materials are moving towards your right because this would be your right if you stand here facing this. And very similarly, if you stand here and facing this shear zone, then you would see material is moving towards your left. The first case, this one has several names 
sometimes we refer it as dextral shear. So, if I draw like this and I ask you what is the sense of shear, then you can say yes, this is dextral sense of shear. Sometimes we call it top to the right the way I explained because the materials is flowing towards the right side or moving towards the right side from the observer. And we also learned that this is known as negative shear, but we hardly use this. Mostly dextral shear and top to the right, these two terminologies are assigned for this kind of kinematics. On the other hand, if it is this way as it is depicted here, it could be sinistral shear, so it is opposite to dextral and also we refer it as top to the left that defines or this phrase actually defines the kinematics in better way if you do not understand what is sinistral and what is dextral. Now, most of the shear zones they are either dextral or sinistral, but there are few shear zones that may be initially started with dextral sense of movement and then switched with later tectonics or later structural event with a sinistral shear. These things are a little complex and that requires a special skill. We will not go into that part at least in this lecture series. But the sense of shear identification in the field and representing them in doing subsequent analysis is, is very, very important as I was talking about. And you have to be extremely careful just looking at one particular signature or one particular shear sense indicator unless it is very much convincing, it is better to look for some other evidences to conclude your observation that yes, this is dextral, yes, this is sinistral. So, in this lecture what I have decided that I will switch from dextral to sinistral, I will switch the scales, we would see some photographs which are in, which, which, were, which were taken in under optical microscope, sometimes with uh, scanning electron microscopes, we will have some field photographs and so on and they not necessarily do represent a single sense of shear. So, we have a bunch of dextral shear examples and we have examples from sinistral shear as well. I have given a few images for your brainstorming, so you can uh, look at these images and think that or and try to analyze that what could be the sense of shear of this particular image which were deformed at a particular direction. So, the first and foremost important uh, shear sense indicator is deflected markers. You have a straight line which is this one, this marker and if I deform it in the dextral manner, I had to do it because this is how it is done in this illustration, then it would deflect and we know that this distance we know how to measure it, this is d. So, this clearly tells you if you do not have this sequence, if you do not have this image or do not have this image, just you look at it, you can clearly figure out that this is moving in this direction, this is moving in this direction, is not it. And therefore, we can clearly say that sense of shear in this system is dextral. If you look at this other image here, this marker got deflected towards this side and this one to this side. So, in this case, this is sinistral. Now, this appears in a very simpler way, but there are several examples and I particularly see that students do a series of mistakes in, in concluding the shear sense particularly from looking at images or objects. So, once we identify this, but there is one particular trick that I will also let you know that how does it work. So, this is in a very simple way you can identify, but let us try to look at some complex situations. For example, this one where we can see that this is the shear zone and this is the wall rock but this is a trace of the marker plane on this section and this is your xz section. Okay? This is a plane xz section. 
Now again, it appears a little bit easier for you that you can figure out that this is something like that and it is going within the shear zone, got extreme ductile deformation, did not lose the continuity anyway and then it is here in this side. So you can say that, okay, this is moving this side, this is moving this side from our previous example and then sense of shear here is dextral, no problem. But if we see this image, if you forget about the older images, that you don't see the other counterpart of this marker line, then the common mistake that we generally do here, what we try to figure out that, okay, so this is like this, so it must be initially like that. And now this part is getting dragged in this side, so therefore we have a shape like this now. So the shear sense is this way. And you conclude that here the shear sense is sinistral. And when I check exam papers, I, I figure out that students generally reply it this way or in some conferences and other places. But this is wrong. Why? Because when we talk about shear sense or shear direction, we generally talk about the movement of the wall rocks, not the movement within the shear zones. So in that sense, we can clearly understand that it was not like this, but it was like this. The marker line was initially here and it got deflected to this side because of the movement within the shear zone, which is happening in this way. So the wall rock is moving this way and therefore this marker which has undergone in the shear zone, we certainly can figure out that here if I draw like this or conclude like this, this is wrong, this is actually a dextral sense of shear. Finally, I have another example where I figure out that people do confuse if I have a situation like this that we have two marker lines, this is again your x, z plane, this is the shear zone and these two are your marker within the shear zone. Now again looking at it, one can immediately conclude, oh, so this one is going this side, this one is going to this side, fantastic, this is sinistral. But again, your interpretation is wrong. The first thing to look at when you see the marker lines from one wall rock to another wall rock, make sure that you are looking at the same marker line. What I mean by that, this marker line has to be the same of this marker line. To, not to confuse with this, I made it little thicker and little thinner. So that clearly tells you that this marker line is not the same marker line here. So this is a different marker line and maybe if I extend it, if I extend the shear zone somewhere here, then maybe it is appearing somewhere here like this which is not in my frame. And this one, if I extend it here, maybe it was somewhere like this, again this is not in my frame. But what I see within the frame, it's important to first figure out that what I see here and what I see here, they are same or not, whether they were once upon a time continuous or not. In this case, they are not. So if they are not, then this interpretation is essentially wrong. So we have to think in a different way. And again, if this is not like this, and then what we have learned in the previous slides, so essentially this is moving in this side and this is moving in this side, so therefore, the sense of shear here is again dextral. Now I said that there is a little trick that you can use to identify the sense of shear when you have deflected markers. And the trick is you identify the curvature. Doesn't matter what is the sense of shear, the deflected marker has to produce a kind of curvature when it is entering towards the shear zone. This curvature could be sharp, could be uh, 
very gentle and something like that. So if you have a shear zone like this and if you can have a curvature like this, you can have a curvature like this or you can have a curvature even gentler like this. Whatever be the case, you look for the closing of the curvature, that which direction the curvature is closing. And the direction is closing, your sense of shear is towards that side. So in each case, this is dextral. If it is sinistral, for example, if I take this one, this example in a sinistral form, it has to be like this. So this is where it is closing, so it is this side, it is in this side. And this is how you finally conclude it, but do not do it mechanically. You understand the mechanics, you understand the kinematics, and out of that you conclude it. But if you really do not have any clue, then this is something that you can use for your CSN's indicators from uh, deflected markers. Let us have a look some examples. These are optical uh, microphotographs that you can see that how does it work. So these are deformed samples uh, and these are experimentally deformed samples. So you can clearly see these black things are quartz grains and these white flecks that you see these are biotite flecks. And you see that this biotite fleck is deflecting this way. Maybe this is not the same biotite fleck, but it is deflecting this way, this one is this way, this one is this way and so on. And this is essentially the shear zone. So at least in this frame, we can figure out the sense of shear is this way. So this is sinistral sense of shear. Now, in a similar way, you can look at here as well. You see that this is your, you can now, your eyes must be set to figure out what is the shear zone, how do they look like. And then again, you can see that these markers are going like that. Here it is like this. So they are coming out this way. This is entering slowly here. This was entering slowly within the shear zone and so on. So again, this is a similar experiment or same experiment. I do not remember exactly but the sense of shear in both cases is sinistral, right? So this is how you work. Now in this example, we have the marker lines on the both sides of the shear zone, but we may not have this case always. We have seen this photograph in the last lecture. So again, this is the ductile shear zone. And this part is the wall rock. Here we have a marker, maybe a little vein here, which is getting deflected towards the shear zone this way. And the sense of shear in this wall is like this. So this is again a sinistral sense of displacement from this marker zone. We will go to another image. We have seen the schematic illustration of such kind of features. Now again, I have a large mica biotite grain here. It might be an optical illusion, but you may figure out that this grain and this grain, these two were together once upon a time. They got shifted this way. So the sense of shear is this way, All right? And you conclude that this is sinistral, but it is not. First of all, there is no evidence that these two grains were once upon a time together. These two grains were actually two separate grains. I did not see it, but you can figure it out from other evidences. What do you see here? This is the shear zone, of course, as you can figure out. And these are the wall rock. This particular grain here, if you consider this as a marker, it is deflecting this way. 
And you can see very nicely how this grain is breaking here while it is undergoing in the shear. And very similarly, you can figure out that this grain is also deflecting this way. And what we have learned from our trick that the direction it closes curvature, it has to be this way. So it is actually suggesting me dextral. Do I have other evidences? Yes. So this one is entering in, in this way here. So these are few interesting things that you can use to summarize that what is the sense of shear in ductile shear zones using deflected markers. It may appear very easy and it may appear as confusing as this image. So be very careful, you look for some other evidences and see what is the actual sense of shear. Not necessarily you have to conclude from this particular image. You have enough exposure, you have enough rocks. So if you can't figure out in a particular area, if you're observing a thin section that what is the sense of shear, you don't have to, no one forced you. You go to the other places of the thin sections and try to figure out. If there is a shear, it's not that there will be only one evidence or only one object to give you the sense of shear. There could be many other possibilities, so look for them, search for them, not necessarily you have to conclude from only one feature. To speak about the features, let's see this image. So this is a large scale image of what we are looking at of the similar experiments, quartz biotite aggregate. What we see here, a series of shear zones. One, two, three, four, someone did not mature, did not come out here, but these are essentially the ductile shear zones. And they are oriented, at least in this image, here is one week, like this, like this, and so on. We also see some fractures here, we will talk about this later. So you can see that this series of shear zones here, they are producing a new foliation, they are producing a new fabric in the system. You also see that we have another fabric which is going like this, which is your primary fabric. they are getting deflected this way. They are undergoing shear, right? So the shear is like this here. Now this is not an individual shear zone. And to think of this uh, consequences, as we talked about in one of our previous lectures, that shear zones are not only characterized by a single set of foliation. During deformation, it produces at least three sets of foliations. Their disposition, that means their orientation, and their angular relationship with the other foliations are fantastic kinematic indicators. So in the following slides, we are going to learn that. And you may come back to this slide again and see what is happening here. So the sense of rotation of the foliation from the margin into the shear zone is generally a very safe kinematic indicator. When the strain increases, this text I took from the book of Fresen, it's very nicely explained. A set of slip surfaces of shear bands commonly forms parallel to the walls of the shear zones and known as C fabric or C -A -C long in French. And this word Siasilo means that if you are cutting the movement of Caesar, so when you cut it like this, that's the movement. And this is known as C fabric. We'll see a lot of images on this. And the foliation verging towards the shear direction is known as S fabric or cystocyte or cystocity, as we talked about. With further deformation, sometimes this C and S they become almost parallel to each other. Even in that case, we call it CS fabric or SC fabric, 
or even they are at an angle, we also call them SC fabric. This SC fabric essentially would produce a structure which looks very similar to the crenulation cleavage and we call it sometimes asymmetric crenulation cleavage. We will see this later. Now, if the deformation continues, then a new set of shear bands or shear localizations do appear within the shear zone involving the previously formed either C fabric or S fabric or both C S fabric. This newly formed shear bands, they verge opposite and oblique to the shear zone margins and these are known as C prime or C dash fabric. And these are particularly common in myelonites rich in platy minerals. So, if you have too much mica and so on, then this kind of C prime fabrics is very common to observe. C fabrics are analogous, we have learnt in our fracture class that R1 low angle riddle shear fracture. So, in ductile domain, this R1 is replaced by C prime fabric. R1 is a fracture and C prime is a tiny incipient shear band produces in series and these are very analogous to the R1 shear fracture. So, let us have a look how does it form. We have seen this black lines before, right. So, you have series of thing and then you can deflect it this way. looking at a shear zone or you have an isotropic rock and you are forming new foliation there. So, these black lines here could be either initial set or foliations that developed during the shear movement, but in this case we will consider that these are foliations that developed during the shear movement. If this is the shear zone boundary, then we know that these newly developed foliations, I need to change the color, I think that is better for you. They make an angle with the shear zone boundary and they remain at an angle to this boundary. However, you have a displacement. In this case, yes, from the marker deflection, you can figure out that this is a dextral sense of shear. And what we see here? Within the shear zone, because there is a movement, sometimes instead of further rotating the foliations, shear zone foliations, the shear zones do develop some tiny shear fractures. So, if I zoom here, you see inside this circle, this red lines here are some tiny shear fractures along which this initially developed fabrics are getting deflected. So, it enters here and then it is emerging here, it enters here, it is going here, it enters here and it is coming out here. So, this initial fabrics which are at an angle with respect to the shear zone boundary, these are known as S fabric as you can see here. And these little slips that you see within the shear zones, these are C fabric. And together the fabric is known as S C fabric. Now, two very important things, S fabric is a foliation and C fabric is tiny slip plane. So, do not confuse C is not a typical foliation plane, C is tiny slip planes which are aligned parallel to the bulk shear direction. So, S fabric is at an angle with respect to the shear zone boundary and C is parallel to the shear boundary. Now, we can clearly figure out that the second point I would like to highlight that how do we understand then what is the sense of shear. Now, if you see here that this interaction between C and S would essentially produce 
a rhombic shape like this. As you can see here. Okay. Or in other words, with a mature deformation, if you don't follow the geometry very honestly, they produce something like this. where this orientation is the orientation of S fabric and this orientation is the orientation of C fabric. So, S is at an angle with the shear zone boundary and C is parallel to the shear zone boundary. Now, once we form this kind of sigmoidal shape essentially, so you see that S is somehow deflected and going like that and this deflection is happening by little shear along the C planes. And S always verges towards the shear direction. So, once we see this kind of features, this within the shear zone fabric, we will see a few of them soon. Then the verging of S fabric defines the sense of shear. So, in this case, it is verging in this side. So, the shear sense is essentially dextral. With further shearing, this C and S fabrics within the shear zones, particularly at the core of the shear zones, when you tend to form almost ultramyelonite, it is not possible to distinguish them separately. In that case, this C and S, they are essentially parallel to each other. So, as you can see here in this area or the zoomed part here, this C S fabric, they are very much parallel to each other. And you cannot figure out which one is C and which one is S. However, maybe you can check this with scanning electron microscopes, then maybe you can see something, but in general you do not see it. This is ultra myelonatized. So, this is known as C S fabric also when they are parallel to each other and this is also known as C S fabric. And sometimes these are known as asymmetric. granulation cleavage. This is analogous to C S fabric. But here we do not see that, at least in the scale we are observing here. If the deformation continues further, then we form a new fabric as we learnt from the text, this C prime fabric. So, here from this marker deflection, we clearly figure out that this is a dextral sense of shear, but if we do not know this, if we just observing somewhere here, then how do we know that this is dextral or sinistral? There C prime fabrics are going to help you. So, C prime fabrics, these are shear planes. They do develop at an angle and with a vergence opposite to the sense of shear. As you can see here that the fabric is developing here like this. And this is opposite the vergence of these lines or this fabric is opposite to the sense of shear. And if we zoom it, then you will see that this fabric initial C S fabric or C fabric or S fabric which was sub parallel or parallel to the shear zone, shear zone boundaries or bulk sense of shear, then these things got also deflected like this. So, the sense of shear is very similar as we have figured it out. So, these are the sense of shear within the shear zone. So, within the shear zone, this micro shear zones which are producing C prime fabrics, these are at an angle with the master 
shear displacement which is this one. And if you remember in fracture lectures, we also understood that at low angles you form riddle shear fractures, the low angle riddle shear fractures with the synthetic sense or same sense of shear movement with the bulk shear direction. So this is why this is analogous to this. So if you see that this kind of displacement, so which is at an angle to the bulk foliation and you also figure out that what, where, the, where it is verging and once you identify these two, then the sense of shear, the bulk sense of shear should be the opposite direction. So it is verging this way. So bulk sense direction should be in this direction. Sometimes in the field, if you do not identify all these things in separately, then again I repeat, you do not have to conclude from looking at C, C prime or C, S fabric if you are not convinced that yes, this is C prime, this is not S fabric. So therefore, you look for other features because we have plenty of things, we just learned only two. We have learned deflected markers and myelinitic foliations, but there are many others that you can use. We have now some examples of myelinitic foliations. We will see one after another. So what we see in these two interesting photographs that this is almost a protomyelonite and we can clearly see that there is a fabric going like this. The fabric is very weak, but it is there. And you also have another fabric here, which is characteristically different from this one. Now, if I consider that this is the fabrics, initial fabric or somehow the fabric which is developing during shearing, then I can clearly figure out that this is verging towards the sense of shear and along this plane or along this fabric, there is no shear displacement or something like that. This is just secondary foliation fabric. But if I try to see here, this horizontal fabric here, I can figure out that there is a faint sense of displacement. So it is moving in this way. Hmm? If I look at here, I can see a faint sense of displacement here. If that happens, then I actually can conclude that this might be the CS fabric. Let us look at the second image as well. The foliation here is more prominent, though this is again protomyelonite, it did not become the ultramyelonite. And then we have another set of fabric like this. And again, you can figure out that there is a sense of movement along this. So these are your micro shear planes. So this also appearing to be the C S fabric. So if we try to conclude it, so it would appear like this that this yellow lines in this both images, these are the S fabric and the red lines in both images, these are the C S fabric. And if that happens from the study we have just finished with the illustrations, the sense of shear must be something like that, where the shear plane should be or bulk shear direction should be parallel to the C fabric. That is why I have aligned it slightly uh, not to the frame of this image. So if you can identify clearly that this is your C fabric, the shear direction should be parallel to the C fabric. Now you see this also in micro scale. So this is a quartz myelonite and you can clearly see that we have one fabric which is C and then we have another fabric which is confined between two sets of C fabrics. So this is C fabric. And then you have S fabric which is at an angle developing like this, right. 
So, in this case S is verging towards like this and C is like this. So, sense of shear in this case must be sinistral. Now, in the development of C S fabric, we also produce because C S fabrics also do involve lot of phyllosilicates, mica and so on. And an interesting structure is being produced which is known as mica fish. And these are your mica fish. Let us have a look at this excellent image from Pashkir and Trau. So, you can clearly see that this mica grains they are defining this S fabric and these are C fabric. Okay. So, the sense of shear in this case is also sinistral, it should be parallel, something like that. So, micas in mylonitic rocks tend to have tails that systematically curve away from the general orientation of the 001 plane of the, this is a crystallographic plane of mica. Such microstructures are known as mica fish and the resulting asymmetry indicates the sense of shear. Mica fish are commonly seen to be confined by the shear bands or in other ways C shear bands and can be regarded as the type of SC structure. So, this is S and this is C and therefore, the sense of displacement at least in this image is sinistral. Now, here I give you one photograph which I am not going to demonstrate what it is. You can identify the foliations and the whether this is C or S, which one is C, which one is S and you try to figure out that what is this or this is at all something from which you can conclude this is CS fabric or not. So, C prime fabric we see here excellently, here the characters are a little bit different. So, this horizontal fabric that you see with the general horizontal trend this could be either C or S or C S fabric together. But we clearly see that if I try to connect that these are not straight, but these are little bit wavy. Of course, we have something here, but we will look about it later. So, we have a sense of displacement along this line. So, we have a different fabric. And again, if we think of our marker deflections, for example, if I try to focus it here, the curvature is going like that and it is coming out somewhere like this. So, the sense of shear within this displacement is like this and this is consistent everywhere, wherever you look. If you look at here, you will also see that this is going like this and if you clear here, this is going like this. So, the sense of shear is at least on these bands are sinistral. So, we can figure out that these things are previous C S fabric which was sub parallel with the large strain, but with continued deformation they got sheared again successively in step wise to produce a series of slip surfaces which are the C prime fabric and altogether they are developing. C C prime or C S C prime or S C prime fabric. And in this case, because these are verging towards this side, they are like this and we also identified the sense of shear within this sense of the shear of the C prime fabric is sinistral. So, bulk shear is also sinistral you see that these are looking like a crenulation cleavage. So, you have this cleavage domain which are C prime. Let me clean this. So, you have your crenulation uh, domain which are C prime 
and then you have in between this microlithons which have fabrics. So these are therefore known as also a special type of crenulation cleavage and this is known as extensional crenulation cleavage or ECC. There are few structural geologists or even few texts you can figure out it is like this. Now we switch to the next uh, type of kinematic indicators in the ductile shear zone and these are porphyroclasts or sometimes you can use porphyroblasts as well but we will restrict to the porphyroclasts terminology but it can include porphyroblast as well as I talked about. So porphyroclasts of feldspar, quartz, mica or other minerals can develop a mantle or recrystallized material that also forms tails and the, the deflection of the tails which are excellent shear sense indicators and are excellent for figuring out what is the sense of shear. And there are three types of porphyroclasts in the sense of identifying the shear direction. One is sigma type, one is delta type and another is phi type. What we see here, we will see in this detail in the illustrations for individual. So this is the initial porphyroclast which may be in a circular pattern or spherical pattern in three dimension and then they form tails in different ways. So here it is like this and if you rotate it, it actually looks like the Greek letter sigma, half sigma okay. or if you add it here then it forms something very similar to this. This is known as delta because Greek letter delta looks like this and they simply you can add another wing and it, it forms like this and this is phi because the Greek letter phi is something like that. So you can draw it like this and then it becomes phi structure. So these are the name, this is the way these, these are named from the Greek letters. So sigma type porphyroclasts have tails that do not cross the reference line. What you see here is this one is a reference line, so some sort of a median line that you can draw from the middle of the clast. So this is the reference line. And if the tails do not cross the reference line, so here it is like this, it, it did not come back like this, right. So if that happens then these are known as sigma type clasts. The delta type clasts they are characterized with the fact that they cross the reference line. Phi type clasts are symmetric about the reference line and these are mostly produced in coaxial deformation. So we are not going to look at it at least in this class because these are not good CSNs indicators only sigma and delta type clasts. So from this we will we'll take now uh, the sigma type and delta type of uh, structures and how they are useful in figuring out the kinematic sense of the shear zones, we will see one after another. First the uh, sigma type uh, structure. So the tails of the sigma clasts, they do extend parallel to the S fabric and wedge out from each side of the grain. The tails are essentially an opposite sides of the reference line and the stepping up direction of the median line defines the sense of the shear. Now before we take a look at this illustration, let us first have a very brief understanding what is tail or what is a mantle structure that we talked about in the previous slide. So if you have a large mineral clast, something like that which is a porphyroclast or porphyroblast and you can deform it by for example simple shear, then the foliations would develop like this perpendicular to the principal axis of stress and around this the foliations would wrap. Right. We have seen this kind of illustrations before. 
So, if I try to figure this one out, we particularly have seen this in the lineation lecture and this place is known as the zone of pressure shadow. Now, this pressure shadow zone is a low pressure zone. So, the fluids from this area, they migrate here and they rest, reside here and they also contain lot of minerals dissolved within these fluids and they slowly start depositing around this place. Now, this is fantastic when it happens in a static condition. So, these are known as mantle structure and these are the tails that is forming this way. Now, imagine if we change the mode of displacement or kinematics of this place, if we apply a shear here, then this grain would tend to rotate. And while it is rotating, it would also drag this tail or mantle structure. And when this is happening, then this eventually would form some very interesting structures and that may not remain symmetric with respect to the reference line. And if it is not symmetric, then we can have two possibilities. One is sigma type, which we are learning in this slide. And after a few slides, we learn another type of asymmetric tail structure, which is delta. So, this is how it happens. Now, coming back to this uh, sigma structure, we figured out that the sigma structures are asymmetric structures and the tails generally do orient themselves along the S fabric. So, what we see here, if this hexagon that is drawn here, these illustrations are from the lecture notes of Professor Bood. So, then you have the hexagon here, which is the mineral grain and then the tail structures would form if the shear sense is dextral as it is given here with the black arrowheads. So, the S fabric would form in this manner and therefore, the tail structure would develop something like that. And these are the strain shadow or pressure shadow zones. And if we look at in that case, this is the reference line. So, if we follow this it goes like this and then it makes a step and works this way. So, you can figure things this way that to figure out what is the step or you can also think of this way that you can take the tip and then follow the reference line parallel to the reference line. You also take the tip and follow the reference line parallel to the reference line and then you connect these two and you see the step is something like that. And that tells you the sense of shear towards this side and in this case, this is dextral sense of shear at least from this illustration. Now, let us have some examples. So, what we see in this uh, image illustration that this one is the mineral grain, the rigid mineral grain. And this is the strain shadow that we are looking at. The sketch is given here on the other side, this one and this is the scale. Now, what do we see here that this must be the reference line of this. And if we try to figure out that the step, then I find the tip and then I draw a parallel line with respect to the reference line. Here is the tip. I again draw a parallel line with respect to the reference line. I connect these two and therefore, once I do that, step is moving upwards towards the left. So, so the sense of shear is sinistral in this case. Now, these are the things that you should practice initially when you see this kind of structures, but slowly your eyes will be trained 
and you will see you don't have to do this. You will automatically figure out what is the sense of movement or sense of displacement, shear displacement when you see a sigma type clasp. Now here are a series of examples that I have provided to you. So I'm doing just here. So you see this is a clasp here again and the line parallel to this and then you see that it is moving up. So the sense of shear is this way. This is another brilliant one. So the tail is something like this here and tail is here and the reference line would be in this case something like that and again you can draw a line parallel to the reference line, you can draw a line parallel to the reference line from the tip, you come at the middle, you see the step is happening in this direction. So this is the sense of shear, in this case it is also dextral. Now this is a little bit complex, the third image. Uh, if I see for example there are mini clasps, so if I see this one here, it is referring to this side, but if I see this one here, this typical clasp that I am seeing here, then it is suggesting this side. So when this happens, it is a little confusing, so you can take as many as you want, so you see different things and then statistically you say, okay, the maximum clasps are showing shear displacement in this manner, so this is the sense of shear. But that may not be always the true idea of doing it, particularly when you see something like this in your field. And you see there are many clasps and they are producing alternate sense of shear in many, many cases. For example, if you look at this, so you have phi structures, you have also sigma structures and so on all together. When you have a lot of clasps and they are highly concentrated, it is advised that you do not interpret the shear sense from this kind of exposures. The reason is, in this case, these clasps are not independent. So the tails and the rotation of the clasps itself is not governed essentially or exclusively by the sense of shear. Sometimes the clasp, for example, if I consider this one, this clasp and this clasp, the rotation of this clasp or the tail structure of this clasp would be highly damaged or altered by the rotation of this clasp so because they are interacting each other. And this is a subject of study in structural geology, subject of research that when you have multiple clasps, how do they interact and sometimes the clasps are also deformable. So all these things to take into account, it is advisable at the very beginning stage that you do not interpret shear sense from this kind of exposures unless you are convinced from some other places. The bottom line of this slide is that try to see an independent isolated clasp which did not get any interference from the other clasp, the deformation of which is solely or exclusively by the bulk shear direction. Delta structure is also very interesting. So the clasp entrains and coils the tails in a sense consistent with the bulk shear to produce an embed shape and consequently the folded wings wrap around the clasp and cross the reference line in the clasp. So in this case what happens, you see this is the, again the mineral grain that we are talking about, the rigid mineral grain and because this grain is rotating significantly, so the tail it also gets dragged in this way when the bulk sense of shear is in this case dextral. And then you see in this side, you develop a concave embayment, which is this one. And in this side, you develop a convex embayment. This is the reference line again. And the tails essentially crossed the reference line due to rotation of the grain and at the same time dragging of the tail, of the upper tail and lower tail. In this case, you can figure out what is the sense of rotation. And once you figure out what is the sense of rotation, then you also see the embayment. So the direction of embayment actually also suggests 
the sense of shear. So if I have the direction of embayment, convex embayment here and the concave embayment here, then the rotation is happening in this way. And that clearly tells you with respect to the matrix foliation, the sense of shear in this case is dextral. We have seen this first image before and you can clearly see it is very similar that this is the clasp and approximately this is the reference line. You have the embayment here, the convex embayment and the concave embayment. So if you draw arrows this way, this gives you the sense of rotation first and second, this also tells you with respect to the foliation outside which is not disturbed by the rotation of this, the sense of shear in this case is dextral. Not necessarily you will see fantastic images like this. So for example, here this is the class again, the second one. Here it is going like this and here it is going like this. So it is moving in this way, it is moving in this way. This is the sense of rotation and sense of shear therefore would be something like that. People have done lots of work in understanding this delta structure and here I would like to show you an analog experiment and see how it, ha how it happens. So what we see here, this is the clasp thing and this black thing is a mantle or the fluid that would be dragged. So you see here, so you see it is rotating, rotating and then you eventually form a structure like this where this was your clasp, this is the tail structure that we see it here. This is the reference line. This is embayment, this is another embayment and we know we have seen that it was rotating in this manner, so the sense of shear here is something like that. And in the field you see in a very similar way the structures like this and this is a little complex but it is producing something as we see here. So this was the clasp. The tail one is like this. And another tail is going like that. So again this is the direction, this is the direction, so it was rotating like this, sense of shear is again dextral. You can also see some very nice images, this one we also have seen and I let you decide that what is the sense of shear. First you figure out the class, then tail structure, you figure out the embayment and then you see the sense of rotation and after that you can also see the step over with respect to the reference line and then you figure out what is the sense of shear. You have two examples here, one is this one and another is this one. Let us talk about another kind of kinematic indicator and these are known as bookshelf structure or fractured objects. Now sometimes in a ductile shear zone you have clasps which are highly cleaved or the minerals itself are, are characterized by their own cleavage. For example, mica and feldspar. And while the shearing is happening, these grains may not undergo ductile deformation but they prefer to sleep along their cleavage planes or crystallographic planes and therefore in the sense of shear or with respect to the sense of shear, these cleavage planes act as some minor slip planes and they produce some typical structures. We have learnt about it in detail in our Budinaj lecture. So what is written here, mica and feldspar, they tend to shear on discrete fractures or crystallographic planes to accommodate ductile deformation in the surrounding matrix. The individual crystal fragments rotate in the sense of the shear direction and these microfractures could be either synthetic or 
antithetic to the general sense of shear, which makes then litigious sense of shear indicators. And these are known as also bookshelf structure, as I told you. So if you have series of books kept on the bookshelf, and if you just tilt them or shear them, they would slip past each other. For example, here, this book is slipping in this way, this book is moving this way, this way, and this way. And therefore, each book is rotating in this manner. Now, we'll see this in the field as well, or in the thin sections, particularly in the ductile shear zone, rich with feldspar and mica. So first we take over the synthetic fractured objects. If the fractures or mineral cleavage initially make a relatively low angle with the sense of shear or with respect to the shear plane, then the shear sense on these fractures is the same as it is on the matrix, implying some back rotation of the fragments. Further shearing motion can lead to the separation of these individual fragments and displaced crystal show displacement consistent with the bulk sense of the shear. So again, you can imagine this is a mineral grain, this one, which is harder, and these are the crystallographic planes or some fractured planes. You can imagine this is a feldspar. And then the bulk shear, in this case again dextral, as it is given by these arrows. So what happens, the crystals then tend to slip in the similar sense of shear displacement because low angle and you can figure out these are actually defining the R1 uh, shear fractures. So with continued deformation, these grains actually would try to rotate backwards, therefore this back rotation is important and then you develop a step-like features and you generate an antithetic uh, rotation of these grains, but the sense of displacement is very much synthetic. If you see this, then the sense of shear is essentially dextral. Let us see some images. And for the antithetic uh, displacements there, the initial sleep on antithetic fractures is opposite to the bulk sense of shear and that is why we have the antithetic term. This is possible if the fractures or mineral cleavage initially make a high angle with the shear plane as we see here. So this is again the shear direction. Say for example, uh, here we have given it as dextral and this initial fracture planes or cleavage planes are oriented with respect to the shear plane at an high angle. If that happens, then the sense of shear changes along these fracture planes. They rotate or they slip this way. And what we see here? So the mineral fragments between these micro fractures are thus rotating consistently with the rotation of the surrounding matrix. So the rotation of these minerals, say they rotate this way. So the rotation is synthetic with respect to the bulk shear direction, but the sense of shear is antithetic. And these are known as antithetic shear fractures. And with this sense, it is possible for us to identify the sense of shear. So here are two examples as we see here. So this is the fractured object, this one, you see these are the fractured planes and they slipped in this manner. We can figure out from these steps and the sense of shear is in this case dextral and here as well you see that they rotated in this manner. These are the fracture, we have seen this image before. These are the fractured planes and they are rotating, they are slipping in this manner which is opposite to the sense of shear and the bulk sense of shear is again in this case dextral. So this is synthetic and this is antithetic. Now I have an excellent image for you to do some brainstorming. So again, it is from the same experiment and what we see here in this image, the scaling electron microscopy image that this grain overall apparently showing a sigma clust when we look at this way but they are producing lots of fractures. 
So you can do a kinematic analysis and figure out, just looking at it, what is the sense of shear. You see, I just give you a clue that you see two fractures going like this, and some incipient fractures are producing here, in this case, like this. You have some fractures here and here. First, you do a geometric model. That means you first try to identify what are the fractures and so on. Then try to figure out what is the sense of displacements along these individual tiny fractures. And finally, figure out what would be your bulk sense of shear. It is dextral or it is sinistral or it is at an angle to, to this uh, or it is not at an angle to the reference frame or maybe something like that or something like this or it is something like this or something like that. So this is how you can figure it out. So this is a problem for you think you first build your geometric model, then you try to build the kinematic model and figure out what is the sense of shear in this illustration. Now we'll go to another kind of uh, kinematic indicators, which are fibers and veins. The orientation of extensional veins indicate the sense of shear in myelonides. Now veins forming under non-coaxial deformation will rotate from the moment they, they initially generate. And this results in a sigmoidal geometry that can be used to determine the sense of shear. So here are two illustrations. What we see here that once I have initiated a, sh a shear in the sinistral manner as you see here, then the bulk strain ellipsoid could be like this instantaneously, ISA. I am just exaggerating it from the original one. So once I have an ellipse like that, in response to the sense of sinistral shear, then clearly this is the long axis and this is the short axis. And in other ways, we can figure out that this is the compression direction and this is the extension direction. If that happens, then it is obvious that fractures would produce like this. So they would have this orientation. Again, we have learned this in our fracture lecture. Okay. So we can produce a series of fractures. Let us take one of them as an example like this. So this is the fracture, which generally tend to form at an angle of 45 degrees with respect to the long axis of the instantaneous strain ellipse. Now the shear continues and this initial fracture which got generated would rotate back this way, isn't it? So it would tend to rotate like this. So if that happens, then it would take a shape like this. But the second instantaneous strain ellipse, which is coming in the next stage with the progressive deformation, would still form fractures at 45 degrees because this is the orientation of the instantaneous strain ellipse. So the new fractures or the growth would happen along this direction. So essentially, you will produce a shape which is sigmoidal like this. And this can continue, continue, continue and then you eventually can have a shape like this where, my God, where this is the latest orientation which is about 45 degrees and this was once upon a time 45 degrees, but now it got rotated significantly. But at the same time, you see that once this got a significant rotation, then instead of continuing from its steep, 
it may produce new fracture along this way and then it again continues rotation in a very similar way and so on which is illustrated here. Now if that happens then you see that once the sense of shear is sinistral then you form sigmoidal shape which is like English letter S and if this happens in dextral manner then the strain ellipse instantaneous strain ellipse would be like this this is the long axis so this is the stretching direction the fractures would tend to form like this and then it would rotate and eventually would form something like this which is like English letter Z and that may have another fracture like this. So if you see fibers or veins or extensional shear fractures within the shear zone with a shape of S then this must be sinistral and if you see in a similar way a shape of Z then this must be dextral but these are instantaneous references it is important that while concluding that whether it is S or Z and then you conclude whether this is sinistral or dextral it is important that you make some sketches you understand the processes and then go further with your conclusions. So here are some examples as you can see here these are excellent uh, tensile fractures it has a shape of sigmoidal shape here and here as well and you can figure out that what is the sense of shear from the slide we just learned and here you see that we have one set of initial thing which is sigmoidal and then you see a series of other fracture planes are coming out this way these are secondary or later fractures of later stage and this is how this fibers and veins the tensile fibers and veins in particular they help you to figure out what is the sense of shear and in both cases at least in this example we see these are in the Z form so the shear sense is dextral. Now finally we will see the folds in the shear zone when we are uh, speaking about or talking about the characteristics of shear zone we said or we spelled it out that shear zones are characterized by asymmetric folds and sheath folds and reclined folds. Now sheath fold is one of the very interesting folds which once upon a time uh, was termed as I folds and sometimes people used to confuse it with the dome and basin structures but later researchers figured out no the mechanism of formation of this kind of folds because it was only restricted in the shear zones. So people researched on it, they performed some analog experiments and they figured out it is essentially a product of shear zone and we see this only within the shear zone and these are known as sheath folds. So in myelonite zones folds form and grow continuously during shearing. At high strains the foliation in a shear zone will in theory be almost parallel to the shear plane as we have learned. It will still be in the extensional field but so close to the shear plane that just a modest perturbation of the layering can make it enter in the contractional field layer parallel compression to make the fold. And what is this modest little perturbation or how folds do form in the shear zone is something a topic of research. So the result is a family of folds that verge in accordance with respect to the shear. So what we see in this illustration that this is the foliation shear is going on which is given with this purple uh, arrowhead. So a little small perturbation would produce a tiny undulation here that you see here with this little uh, shade. And if things continue then this tiny undulation would accentuate to produce something like that and if further actuates these two sides are pinned and this would continue to propagate. So eventually you form something which is like a flat cone right and this you see in this 
image excellent field photograph here and these are known as sheath folds and you know what is sheath? Sheath is a container where warriors used to rest their swords. So the shape is like this as you can see here. So sheath is something like that. So where warriors they used to keep their sword in their uh, thing and the sword is inside this. So this is known as sheath and the fold is very much similar to this kind of uh, sheath and therefore this is known as sheath fold. A cross section of this, if I make a cross section, then it would look like this. As you see here. Now people have seen them in the field, so this is the initiation of the sheath fold as you can see here. They, they move like wave and with further deformation you can generate sheath folds like this. So if you go to a myelinitic zone and keep your eyes open, you know the theory what is sheath fold, you know how does it look like. It is essential or it is obvious that you must find a sheath fold in the shear zone. And here are some excellent examples, I took it from Ian's paper and Ian Alsop and then you see that these are extreme beautiful examples of sheath folds. You can also, if you are interested, you can go and read this excellent paper in 2007 published in Journal of Structural Geology. And finally, the asymmetric folds. So the sense of the vergence of this uh, foliation plane of the folds, they generally define the shear sense. So for example, you see here, this is the general shear zone foliation going like that. But few foliations would tend to develop some kind of folds as you can see here, as you can see here and in many other places. This also rotated this way and so on. So if that happens, then the vergence of the axial plane of these asymmetric folds would give you the sense of shear which is in this case dextral. You can see also here there are many minor folds and then a large fold and so on. So this is essentially an asymmetric fold the way we learnt in our fold lecture. We see also one here and it is verging in this side. So therefore again sense of shear here is like this. And I have the final picture here. What we see here, this is how the myelonite look like, extremely foliated rock as you can see here and you see some folds going like this. And the vergence is like this, so in this case the sense of shear is sinistral. So in this lecture we have learned a number of uh, kinematic indicators of tactile shear zones that can help you to identify the sense of shear. I said during the lecture but I would like to repeat it again, do not conclude just observing only one feature on the sense of shear. You look for some other evidences, at least collect a good number of evidences, you will be convinced by yourself and then you conclude that yes, this is the sense of shear. So I conclude this lecture and with this I, uh, we all finish the basic understandings of the structural geology. We covered all topics which are relevant for structural geology, but we learnt them only on the slides or with some field photographs. The primary job or what is expected from a structural geologist is that he or she should be an expert of reading and performing uh, lithostructural mapping and this is one of the most important aspects of structural geology. And this is what we are going to learn in the next lecture which or the last week which is basics of structural mapping is the topic of the next week. Thank you very much, have a nice time, I will see you in the next week.